Good morning. Good to see everybody this morning. We're going to be singing out of the Methodist hymnal this morning, so if you get your hymn book out, let's all stand and sing Standing on the Promises, hymn number 374. 374. Let us pray. Father, we're so thankful to be in your house this morning to worship and praise you this morning, Lord, with our family and friends and church family. And God, we thank you for such a wonderful week this week you've given us. And Lord, we know that uh, you've been there with us along that walk this week. And God, we continue to ask you to pray for our church and anything that we do in the church is to be used for your glory and honor. And God, we're so thankful for the message you've got uh, Brother Steve lined up for us to hear today. We hope that everyone is here to receive that message with open minds and open hearts this morning and God we continue to ask you to look over the ones in our church and our church family and community that's not uh, feeling very well we ask you to continue to lift them up and do whatever it takes to heal their bodies Lord this morning again we thank you for everything and we love you this morning amen you may be seated
Good morning. Good morning. That's working really well, isn't it? <laughs> good morning. It is so good to see you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being here. We want to welcome everyone who's joining us this morning for this morning's worship service. Uh, those who will be joining us through the different forms of media, we are glad to have you with us. It is a joy uh, to look out across this congregation and see so many faces today. Already, before we even get to the sermon or the singing, I feel blessed, and I, ho I hope you do too. So glad to have you. We encourage those who can hear us and who are listening to us. If you don't have a church home, we would love to minister to you. We would love to show you our love for you as Christ has called us to love you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being a part of this day. What a joy it is to see each and every one of you. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Steve. We're going to get back into our worship and song this morning. Our first hymn is To God Be the Glory. It's hymn number 98. Let's all stand as we sing. standing for our affirmation of faith. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. We believe in God the Father Almighty, infinite in wisdom, power, and love whose mercy is over all his works, and whose will is ever directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope, and the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit as a divine presence in our lives, whereby we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of Christ and find strength and help in time of need. We believe that 
that this faith should manifest itself in the service of love, as set forth in the example of our blessed Lord, to the end that the kingdom of God may come upon the earth. Amen. You may be seated. Our next hymn this morning is hymn number 130, God Will Take Care of You. We're going to sing the first and fourth verse, 130. time now for our children's message, so all of our youngsters will come on down at this time. Miss Shelley's waiting on them. good-looking crowd today. I didn't have very much faith this morning when I was preparing my children's message. Y'all will still enjoy it. Our Bible story today comes from 1 Samuel 20, and the title of it is We Can Choose to Be Good Friends. Can you choose to be a good friend? Yes. These events took place in a scary time during David's life. King Saul knew that David was going to take his place on the throne someday, and he was not happy about it. He wanted his son Jonathan to be the next king, so he decided to kill David. However, David and Jonathan were best friends. They did everything together. The king invited David to a feast. The two friends suspected it was a trap so the king could kill David. They agreed that David would skip the first three days of the feast. If the king got mad, then they would know it because, was because he planned to kill him. Sure enough, after three days, King Saul became furious that David wasn't there. Jonathan knew that his father wanted to kill David, so he took his servant to a field where David was hiding in the bushes. He shot three arrows past the target and shouted, Behold, the arrows went past the target. That was David's signal that the king was mad at him. So David was able to run away and be safe because his good friend helped him. What do you think made Jonathan such a good friend? Uh, because he chose to be. He chose to be a good friend. And was he looking out for his friend? Yes. And told him his daddy wanted to kill him. Well, what kind of people do you like to be friends with? Nice people. Nice people? Funny people. Funny people? Nice people. Nice people? Courageous people. 
funny people? How can our friends help us be better friends with God? Do you have any friends that are they can help you? Can they tell you what do what, darling? Tell you all about God. Could they maybe tell you about what their Sunday school lesson was about or the Bible story they might have read? That would help you be better with God, wouldn't it? It's important to have good friends that help each other, just like Jonathan helped David. We can choose friends with the qualities we listed, and we can choose to be a friend with those qualities too. Now sometimes at school, when some of my students are, seem like they're always fussing, especially those rowdy boys, and they'll get in trouble because of who they're playing with because they're not acting like they should. And sometimes I tell them, maybe you need to find somebody else to play with. Because you know, sometimes people just rub you the wrong way and they do stuff you don't like and then you get in a squabble. So it's important to choose good friends that believe the same things you do. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, thank you for these precious young folks and how much joy they bring to our lives. Help them to make good choices, to, to choose good friends, and to remember to be a good friend to others. Bless us in the coming week and keep us near you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you, Miss Shelley, and thank you to our young folks that come down for our children's message this morning. It's time now for this morning's regular offering. That'll be followed by our building fund offering.
may be seated. Our last hymn before we have our message this morning is hymn number 707. 707. like to join with me in reading this morning. I'm going to be reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 11. We're going to have a long reading today. The Gospel of John, chapter 11, verses 1 through 43. John 11, verses 1 through 43. John 11, verses 1 through 43. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sister sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you loved is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to his disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and and are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks in night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. These things he said, and after that he said to them, Come, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death. But they thought that he was speaking about taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, nevertheless, let us go to him. 
Then Thomas, who is called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us go that we may die with him. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away, and many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Now Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. And when she had said these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary, her sister, saying, The teacher has come and is calling for you. As soon as he heard that, she rose, arose quickly and came to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into town, but was in the place where Martha met him. Then the Jews who were with her in the house and comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, followed her, saying, She is going to the tomb to weep there. Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews came, who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled and said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him? And some of them said, Could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? And they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said these things, he cried with, cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave cloths, and his face was wrapped with the cloth. Jesus said to them, Loose him and let him go. May the Lord bless the reading and the hearing of his words. St. Francis of Assisi is, is credited with this poetic prayer. He writes, Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let us sow love. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is sadness, joy. Where there is darkness, light. O oh, Divine Master, grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, not so much to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned. It is in dying that we are born again to eternal life. I think that's a beautiful prayer, a, a beautiful poem written by a man who, for the remainder of all that we know, will always be referred to as, as St. Francis. And, and I think appropriately so. His words convey the thoughts of his heart. And those words are, are a heart that, that can feel such things, a heart that can be known by such things, is a heart that is in tune with the God we serve and the God we believe in. Those people who are instruments of peace, those people who sow love, those people who offer hope, those who, who provide joy, they are a light in the darkness that we often find ourselves living in, in all of its forms. Those who console and, and, console and love and give and pardon, they, they bear a witness. They are his image in our world and, 
and in our lives. As it is very appropriate to call them saints and to remember them and to celebrate with them the joyous rewards they so richly deserve for their service to God and Christ. This is a special day in the life of the church. Today, today we remember those who, who made a difference in us and a difference in, in their part of their world. But today the, we don't focus on, on what they did. We, instead we celebrate. We celebrate what they inherited because of their love for God in us. Their lives, their relationship with Christ, send us, I think, at least in our minds and our hearts to, to a place where we believe that, that all is perfect, where all is well, where God himself, as the scriptures say, wipes away all of our tears. We celebrate that truth. We believe in that truth. That for those who, who know Christ, there is a resurrection. There is a new life. A new life in the place that we often refer to as heaven. A place of infinite glory and, and splendor. A place where God and, and Christ dwell with us forever. It's a good thing, isn't it? Heaven. It's our great hope. Everlasting life with God, that is our reward. That, that is our, our prize for having believed, for, for giving our lives to Christ. That's what we advocate every week in our worship services. We cling to that promise as we should. Today, our, our text comes from John chapter 11. There is much to be seen and heard and understood in that text, far more than, than one sermon could possibly do justice to course we we recognize this passage as the story of Lazarus's resurrection and in this story we we can find at least at least two truths two truths that to this day for all of us are very important to us the first truth is this our God has the power to resurrect resurrect men Christ resurrected Lazarus. God would later do the very same thing for his, his only son. But I tell you that the second truth is, is no less important than, than the first truth. What Christ did for Lazarus, what God did for Christ, the same he will do for each and every one of us. We who be believe in God and Christ hold to that. We cling to that. That same promise is a part of who we are as Christians. It's an interesting thing, isn't it? We all believe in that promise. It's a very, very important part of our faith. This is the, the promise that, that keeps us looking upward, that this is our reward, this is what we live for, this is what we anticipate. But we never approach this glorious moment without some sorrow. How ironic is it that in the midst of sorrow, there is triumph for God's people. Because we, we have sorrow, but that just makes us uh, more as God intended for us to be. That's, that only happens because we are loving creatures. God made us so that we thrive in this world at best in, in relationships with one another. Heaven, though a, a temporary termination of, of those relationships, is not something we run to or seek to get there as quickly as we can, do we? I have a lot I, I, I want to do, don't you? I want to love on my grandson. I want to hold my wife close. I want to have a grandbaby number two. I hope my daughter and I heard that. 
I want to keep my relationships with my friends and my brothers and my sisters in Christ. Who does not want those things? But there is a, another truth that, that we must understand and, and we have to accept. There is a destination in front of all of us here. We know that there is. So the Lord wants us to, to be able to think and, and see a little bit beyond this world. He wants us to understand that, that all of this that is, that is normal to us is, is fleeting. That someday it will indeed all pass away. But with Him it will all last forever. That is our promise. That is our hope. That is what is up ahead of us. Jesus resurrects those who love them and those whom he loves. That is a part of Lazarus' story. Lazarus was very much loved by Christ. The scriptures speak of, of Christ's affection for him. And you can be sure that that affection was mutual between the two of them. Those of us who are gathered here today, can we not say the same? We are here, aren't we? Because we have found it easy to love God and easy to love and, and to honor Christ. Yes, we, we love the Lord. And because we do, the resurrection that Lazarus, Lazarus experienced is a moment that we too will also experience someday. But still I know the truth as you do. We cannot come to that moment in this life. And it's still a very difficult journey we make when a loved one has, has gone on before us. It is normal and loving to sorrow at that thought. Even on the very day we, we celebrate the saints. But I also think that it is comforting to remember. That is not something we do alone. Sometimes we, we need comfort that even our closest friends and even our families cannot give us. Have you read verse 33? Have you seen what it says? Join me, if you will. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jew Jews who came along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and trouble. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. And then what did the scripture say? Jesus wept. See how he loved him, they said. Jack Neighbors was our DS several years ago. Some of you may remember Jack, and some of you may know that, that Jack today is being counted among the saints. He's gone on to be with the Lord. But I remember one charge conference we had not too many years ago in which he told us the story, a story about a child, a child and, and his four-wheeler. The child lost control of his four-wheeler, and he, and he hit a tree. The damage to the little fellow was severe and, and the child perished in the accident. Of course, the family was broken. But the time had come that they, they had to go plan to make arrangements. So they, they left home to, to make those arrangements. When they returned, there was family and friends all in the yard and, and in the house and there was food all over the table. Folks were, were there ready to comfort them, ready to, to help them during this time. As the mother of the little boy entered the house, a friend with all good intentions said to her, oh, it was just his time, it was the Lord's will for him. To which the mother turned immediately at her and said, no, no, it was not his will and it was not his time. Christ is crying the very same tears I'm shedding at this moment, she said. What did the scripture say? He wept. I think she's right. 
He hurts for us in the midst of our own sorrows. But all at the time, same time, he keeps reminding us, I have a wonderful place for those you have loved so long. All Saints Day is a time to celebrate those who have gone on before us. But I know the truth. Sometimes it is not easy, is it? And that makes for us a, a bit of a somber tone. I understand that. But the story goes on. Jesus, though he, he met them in a time of sorrow, was, was about to change that time into a time of, of rejoicing and joy for that family. Jesus said that if they believed, Lazarus could live again. Martha proclaimed him the Christ. Jesus said the glory of God would be revealed. Christ called into the tomb and Lazarus lived again. And the scriptures go on to say, and because of what Jesus did, many believed in him. That's how it all works. There is a moment in, in our lives when we say we believe in him. There is this profession of faith, and, and in that profession of faith, a, a covenant is made, a covenant established. We promise God to, to live our lives in a, in a manner consistent with his image, his words, and the, and the life of Christ. And because, and because we do, God promises we will never die. We will never be bound by death. We will live forever. That is the power of our God. That is the power of our Lord. That is our promise. A promise that we can't fathom, we, we can't imagine what it is like or, or will even be like. We only believe how, how wonderful it must be, how wonderful it has to be. That is what God wants us to see and understand. There is a paradise. And someday we will all be there together. Max Licata, who by now you have figured out is one of my favorite writers, has a wonderful way of, of describing how the saints of God are received in glory. He pens these words. You will be home soon, too. You may not notice it, but you are closer to home than ever before. Each moment is a step taken. Each breath is a page turned. Each day is a mile marked and a mountain climbed. You are closer to home than you've ever been before. Before you know it, the day will come. You will descend the ramp and enter into the city. And you will see all of those faces that are there waiting for you to get there. And you will hear your name spoken by those who love you most. And in the back, behind the crowds, there will be the one. The one who would rather die than live without you forever. And he will remove his nail-pierced hands from his heavenly robe. And he will bring his hands together. And he will applaud now that you have arrived. What a glorious thing it is to know that those who believe in Jesus, those we call saints, the ones who have given their life to Christ, will never die. They are, as St. Francis said, Born again to eternal life. What a glorious and joyful thing to know. We will all one day live forever. With our Christ. The very one. Who is ready to rejoice with us. When finally we arrive. Our closing. Our closing hymn is uh, page 701 in your Methodist hymnal. Let's sing all of the verses of page 701. Would you stand and sing?